That was a huge sum of money. So I'm wealthy again. I thought, like, wow, what a great country America is. I just can't get over this country. You can fall on your ass and you can get up and do it again. Wow. Huh. It's a really good thing. <laughs>You grew up where, Colin? Grew up in uh, North Queensland, Australia. My people had a cattle property there. What year was that? That was, uh, I was born in 1942 and I, was, I stayed on and off the cattle property until I was into my early teens. And then I went, uh, then I went south with my, to live with my dad and, and uh, my mother. And he was quite an entrepreneur. He built an ice works. And um, I'm one of, one of seven kids, the eldest son. And I have uh, three brothers and three sisters. And it was, uh, it was a great time in Australia. We had a cattle property that was so small it was laughable. But it was 500 square miles. It was laughably small. <laughs> But it was, um, it was a good time. Uh, my only problem was uh, I couldn't speak properly. I had a very bad speech impediment. I started incredibly badly for reasons I didn't really understand and nobody understood anything in those days, of course, if you had something wrong with you or they just said, well, take an aspirin and fix that. So that's basically what happened to me. and. Uh, so I was thrown out of schools all over the place and this went to a little country town on the rim of the outback where my dad built an ice works. And in those days it was pre-refrigeration in the 50s. And uh, so people were astounded and mesmerized with ice. And he made big blocks of it. And he was quite an entrepreneur. But um, he lost patience with me and I don't blame him. He was such a wonderful man. Uh, and he says, you've got to get out of here. And I'm 14 years old. And I said, uh, yeah, well, probably a good idea. He said, you've been thrown out of every school. They don't want to see you in school anymore. He said, you don't learn anything. You're as thick as a brick. And I says, yeah, well. And I'm stouting and stammering. And I said, well, OK. So I got on my horse, had a horse called Queenie which uh, we're now down in this little town of Mariba on the rim of the outback. I'd left the cattle property. And uh, my dad hated horses. He thought they were the stupidest thing in the world, which caused a lot of friction between he and I because I love horses. And I had this horse called Queenie. Uh, and a, a guy called Henry Shaw, who was trying to make racehorses, and he had Queenie as a... Um, a pacing horse, he called it, where he'd, he would ride Queenie and bring the race horses along and, and uh, get them conditioned to try and run them around the track. But Queenie wasn't fast enough, so one day, out of fit of anger, he said to me, Colin, he says, take this stupid horse before I put a bullet in his head. I said, yeah, OK. So I took Queenie at about the same time Dad decided I should get out of the house because I was too much trouble. And I said, don't blame you. So I got on Queenie and I'm uh, 14 years old, haven't been to school for about four years, three years. Every time I'd go to school, it'd be a disaster because <clears throat> I couldn't talk properly and get into fights. And, and I learned to box pretty good. Uh, I went to one of those, there was a boxing troupe called the Jimmy Sharman Boxing Troupe. And they had these little country sort of fairs and. So I went and I put my hand up at the Jimmy Sharman boxing troupe. And I only ever had one trick in those days, but it was a good one. Somebody had picked me and wanted to punch my lights out. And I'd say, ah, oh, funny shoes you're wearing, aren't they? They'd look down, boom, there was an uppercut right there with a uh, powerful uppercut, right, left, left end of the side, down goes the head, another uppercut, boom, they're out. So it was, it was no problem at all. I thought, this is easy. <laughs> That's all you got to do. But anyhow, so, you know, it was, school for me was a very bad, very 
bad thing. Well, my problem was I couldn't speak. I'd try to make sentences and words had just run together. And uh, people thought I was an idiot. Uh, and uh, I probably sounded like an idiot. So I got on Queenie and in this little town of Mariba and uh, rode out 30 miles to a place called Paddy's Green. And Paddy's Green was uh, just a desolate area, uh, euphemistically called Paddy's Green, there was nothing green about it. But there was a lagoon there that I, that I, that I was aware of. So I thought, this is great. Now, when I was a kid on the, on the cattle property, I played with the Aboriginals, the Aboriginal children. And uh, they, they were pretty reticent about me playing with them because I was stark white and they're black, black, black. Australian Aboriginals are not just black, they're blue black. They're the blackest black you ever saw in your life. You know, they talk about Americans being black and I look at black people here and they look white to me. But uh, there, they're black, black, black. And uh, so the Aboriginal kids used to just laugh at me and say, ha. Oh. You know, so I'd cover myself all in mud, take all my clothes off, put them up in a tree, cover myself all in mud, I have a loincloth on, cover that in mud too, and I'm totally covered in mud. And then they could accept me. Then I'm playing with them all the time and, and uh, learned to throw spears and I was, I was pretty good with a spear. I was better than any of they were, better than them were. And I could knock them and I could do pretty good with a boomerang. So I was, uh, I was very happy about that life. But, um, and not being able to talk didn't matter with the Aboriginal kids. But now, transpose years later and I'm in this little town of Mariba, I'm 14 years old. Dad's kicked me out. I got a lot of problems. It's the way I got school's just a disaster. So I get on my horse called Queenie. She was a mare, a, a, a whitey sort of mare. And um, rode her out to this Paddy's Green that I remembered seeing at one time and uh, took off all my clothes like I used to way back when, made a loincloth, put the clothes up in a tree and uh, thought, this is great. This is fantastic. There's nobody around. So this is just marvelous, marvelous. Just, I was so ecstatic. And uh, there's a lagoon right there, and I check out the lagoon, and I see fish in it. I thought, oh, this is good. So I'd, I'd just passed, coming in, I'd passed a wire fence, fenced off by some cattle guy, I guess. So I got some stones together, cut off three hunks of wire, banging stones together, and um, found a long bamboo pole, shoved the sticks up in that, sharpened them on the stone, and started and speared fish out of the lagoon. And uh, I could light a fire with a stick as quickly as anybody else could with a match. So a little fire, got that going, put the fish in that, thought, wow, this is the life, wow. Nobody out here to bug me, wow. I'm completely free, wow. So now I, I got, uh, made, a, made another spear out of, uh, found a, a hunk of, there was a cattle yard not too far from there, and so I, there was an old gate that had fallen over, but I found a bolt out of that. And I, I, sh and I spent hours making a point on the bolt, then I strapped that to a long pole, and that was gonna be my wallaby spear, and I speared a wallaby with it very easily. What shocked me most of all was that um, I'd approached wallabies before many, many times and they all ran away. But now I'm all covered in mud and they didn't run away. They accepted me as one of them. And I thought, well, this is so cool. I like this. So I'm looking the wallaby in the eye and, and of course I felt a bit bad about spearing the damn thing but I thought, well, I'm hungry so this wallaby's out of here. So the wallabies are small kangaroos about two feet high, three feet high. So it um, uh, ripped its guts out, reminded myself I've got to find a knife from someplace. Didn't have a knife. So I just um, ran my hand up its butt, ripped it, ripped the guts open like that, dropped all the guts out, 
put the wallaby in the, in the coals and just left it there all day and um, covered it with some banana palm leaves that were readily on the bank there. Came back that night after messing around and there it was, a beautifully cooked wallaby. Open it out, it's just beautiful steaming. Ah, oh, this is so good. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a very, very good time there. And uh, so I've got Queenie tied beside me and I said to Queenie, I said, well, what do you think of this, Queenie? Is this better than where you were in that stupid old stable with the Henry Shaw who's beating the crap out of you because you couldn't go fast enough? I says, works for me here. I hope it's working for you. And so I had, have had a few conversations with Queenie and uh, this went on for a couple of weeks and I'm really, really becoming one with this whole situation. I loved it, loved it. And uh, so I'm talking to Queenie and then it occurred to me, I said, wait a minute, I can talk to Queenie like people talk to each other. I said, wow. And I was stunned at this revelation. You weren't stuttering. I weren't stuttering. And what the trick was, I think what did it for me, was that I had to, that I spoke slowly to Queenie, thinking that she needed uh, slow speech, otherwise she wouldn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> Ridiculous. But uh, so I'm talking to Queenie, I'd say, hello Queenie, how are you today? Stuff like this. So wait a minute, I can say that even a bit faster. Hello Queenie, how are you today? Oh, that's pretty good. So I'm really stoked with this idea. So I said, yeah, this is good, this is good. So um, I got, um, I'm in there for about three weeks in the bush and I uh, thought, well, my mother said that she was gonna hang up a sugar bag full of supplies for me on this little country road that was nearby, about 30 miles from where the lagoon was. <clears throat> so I said, Queenie, we're going out to see what mother's dropped, hung up in that tree for me. She told me where the gum tree was at the, at the, at the fork of the road there. And sure enough, I go there and there's the, there's, the, there's the sugar bag that she had left me and it had flour in it, self-raising flour, uh, tea, uh, sugar, uh, pepper, salt, and uh, so several cloves of garlic. And I thought, wow, this is pretty good. Most of all, she had, put, had a couple of tin plates in there and knives and forks. I thought, gee, I'll be, I'll be in the Hilton Hotel right here. This will be... Well, I didn't have a Hilton Hotel then, but I'll be in some of those fancy tourist hotels. So, um, go back and say, this is marvellous. This is great. So, another week or two, week, week goes by, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and see if Mother's got that sugar bag there again. I can do with some more self-raising flour. I'd, I'd made what I call a damper. I'd figured out how to make it with the self-raising flour, wet it, put salt in it, put that in, in the coals, take it out to be black, look like a black cylinder, but if you cut it, smoke came out of this beautiful bread. Oh, man, it was so good, so good. Well, I was hungry most of the time, so I guess that was one reason it tasted so good. Um, so it was uh, very enjoyable, and I thought to myself, yeah, so I rode back out again to see what mother might have hung something back in the tree for me. And to my surprise, a little old beat up truck comes along and it stops. And my first instinct was to run. First of all, the police are looking for me. I'm a runaway. I'm considered halfway dangerous because I did, I did break a few noses and put a few teeth down people's throats because uh, they, they made fun of me. Um, and uh, I thought, no, I can't run, because if I run, that guy in that truck's going to call the cops. The cops would love to know where I am. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'd put, I'd, before I came into the, to the, uh, to the fork in the road there, I'd put my, wash myself, put my clothes on so I'd be, appear normal. And so I'm, I'm standing, sitting on my horse there, and I, I suppressed a, 
a big urge to run. I thought, no, no, I can't run because he's going to report me. I'll just look normal. So he says, uh, he said to me, who are you? And I said, my name's Colin Dangard. And he says, what are you doing out here? I says, riding my horse. You should be in school. I said, and, straight, and straight away I started stuttering again. So I couldn't talk properly. And, uh, but I didn't want to gallop off, so I just stayed there. And he says, um, you should be in school. Shook my head. And he said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, a writer. I want to be a writer. He said, do you read? And I said, yeah. So I got, reached back in my old saddlebag. I built myself a, an old uh, Australian stock saddle from bits and parts I'd found. Took out a copy of Jack London, Call of the Wild. I showed him my book. He said, oh, Jack London. He says, I read Jack London. Ah, so we got to talking about Jack London. And I relaxed a lot. And I was speaking a bit better because I was relaxed. <clears throat> and he says, he says, okay, he says, in one week's time, I'm coming by here again. He said, I'm going to leave a something for you under that gum tree. I said, okay. And he, to my great relief, he drove off. I thought, wow, that's a, what I call a close call because he's not going to call. I felt very sure he wasn't going to tell anybody. So um, a whole week I waited to one, wondering what was going to be under that gum tree for me, what this old, what this old guy is going to leave me. And I go back, ride back 30 miles. Took me all day to get back there again. And uh, there was even another sugar bag from Mother, which was great. Um, so there's some supplies there. And underneath the, the gum tree was a Olivetti portable Royal typewriter. Must have been made in the 20s. It was an old, old typewriter. Now, I knew about typewriters because before I got thrown out of school, they had a typewriter and we could bang on the keys. It was a Catholic school, and which is a terrible, terrible place. They just beat the hell out of us. And um, so I get this typewriter and I go, wow. He also had a stack of papers there and three spare ribbons. I thought, this is greatest thing I've ever seen. A typewriter. And it's mine. Wow. So I managed to get it on my horse, Queenie. I've got the, I got a stack of papers and I got this typewriter and Queenie's not too happy about this. So there's a little bit of pirouette and ronde jambe going on there, but I managed to stay on and don't drop the typewriter. If I was going off, I, would, I was going off, I was going to land on my back and hold the typewriter. I had rehearsed the fall if I needed to, but I didn't have to fall. So rode all day balancing the typewriter. I got back to Paddy's Green and the lagoon, put the typewriter on a rock, and I just looked at it and was mesmerized with this typewriter. I thought, wow, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. So, you know, so I thought, in the morning, Got up early, sunrise before sunrise, sat, sat the typewriter up on a rock and uh, started banging away on the keys. Oh, I was so thrilled. I thought, that's it. I'm going to start writing stories. I'm going to start writing stories because I, I read a lot of Man magazines and Adam magazines, and in those days there were thousands of magazines, magazines for for boys who were 10, boys who were 15, boys who were 20, etc. Same with the girls. There were thousands of magazines everywhere. So as a, I'd read quite a bit of uh, Ma Ma Adam magazine and Man magazine, and um, they were the big ones for the men. And uh, they were high adventure things, and I thought, oh, I'm going to write for them. That's what I'm going to do. So I get the, type, get the paper and the typewriter and start tapping away. Queenie's right there. And I said, Queenie, 
Listen to this. Okay, you ready? It was a dark night. Of course it was a dark night. Every story has, starts with a dark and stormy night. It wasn't stormy though, it was just dark. Bruce looked out, my man character, Bruce. Bruce looked out across the lagoon and what did he see? He saw what other people would think was a dragonfly coming towards him. Just a little speck on the mirrored, with the lagoon reflecting the, the moon like a mirror. It was just coming on, the moon was starting to come up. But Bruce knew it was not a dragonfly because 20 feet behind the dragonfly, the water was being disturbed rhythmically. Bruce knew it was a crocodile and it was heading his way. I said to Queenie, what do you think of that, Queenie? Is this going to be a good story or what? <laughs> so anyhow, we got the story written and it took me, it took me a week to write the story, about a thousand words. And I imitated how it would be in Man Magazine, how they would write it. And uh, took it back out because the, the old guy said he was going to come and buy in a week and that, was, that, that day would be a week. And I stayed there all day and sure enough, at dusk he comes by and I'm out there with my horse, stepped my horse and uh, I showed him this story. I said, he's my first story. And he says, he wrote something. I says, yeah. I said, you can, he says, can I read it? I says, yeah, I want you to read it. Then I want you to copy, it, post it to Man Magazine. This is their address here. And he says, he read it and he says, that's a good story. I says, yeah, well, I'm glad you like it. So I passed it off to Man Magazine. Then I went back to the bush again. So I started writing again. And uh, uh, went and saw him next week. And he kept asking me if I had anything written. I says, no, I'm working on something. So about four weeks go by, and I didn't go and see him for three weeks, but I went back another time, and sure enough, he came up. And... Uh, he said, I've got some news for you. He said, uh, Man Magazine has accepted your story. I said, you really? They did? He said, yeah. They're going to send you a check. I said, whoa, how much for? And he says, for like a hundred pounds. hundred pounds in those days would be enough spending power today of about um, $500, I guess. I said, wow. So I got back to the bush. I said, well, I'm going to write another one. I said, uh, so uh, I said, I'm going to need some envelopes and things. So he said, yeah, I'll bring some. So I started, so I wrote another story. And sure enough, I, that got published too. And I thought to myself, wow, this is, this is really good. So I, I got a now stack of papers and I'm pounding out stories from Man Magazine. And then I thought, well, I really gotta, gotta get some money from somewhere, some cash. Now at this time in Australian history in the 50s, Australia lost more men per head of population than any allied country. So Australia in the 50s was full of old men, boys, women, and children, that was it. <clears throat> So to solve this problem, the Australian government wisely sent uh, ships to Italy, Sicily, Albania, every country in Europe. And if you, uh, if you were a male and had a heartbeat, you got free passage to Australia where somebody gave you a hunk of land. And uh, if, you, if you wanted to farm or they got, a, they got you a job at some place if you wanted, didn't want to farm, and uh, they gave you essentially what they what was a loan. You had to pay it back. Of course, nobody ever did, but that was the government uh, line on it. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, I thought, wow, this is this is great. Um, now, meanwhile, the the Australians up in the northern cattle country where I was from. Um, a lot of some of them were Italians, but there was established old families there like mine. We were there uh, in uh, in the 1800s, came early, 
and there was wild Aboriginals all over the place in those days. So it was, um, <clears throat> it was pretty wild in this little tiny town with the Italians fighting, and they were called New Australians, and the New Australians fighting the old Australians. And this little dusty main street of Mariba was just a bloodbath every Saturday morning. People having tremendous punch-ups. Oh, my God. And in those, and in, and if people had punch ups in those days, it was you didn't uh, you didn't stop the fight. That wasn't the deal. You made a circle and you made sure that nobody uh, pulled a knife or or did any underhand blows. It had to be Queensby rules, as they said. So you had to had to shape up and punch, punch, and and defend and do all that stuff, and you could knock somebody down. And uh, so it was, it was just a, the wildest, wildest town. But the, the drovers had come from the north with their cattle and they would uh, sell their cattle at this cattle yard in Mariba, let the horses go loose, and they'd come into town, fight the Italians for a whole week, and there'd be blood and guts in the streets of Mariba. And then, uh, then they'd go back in the blitz truck America, during its occupation of Australia, not its occupation while they were there, to defend us from the Japanese, they all had these blitz trucks, which were built by Ford. There were thousands and thousands of blitz trucks. So uh, when, the, when the Americans left, they were supposed to destroy all these blitz trucks, but they didn't. Instead, they left keys in them. So anybody, you could find a blitz truck with a key in it, you owned it. So they would, these drovers had put their all this stuff in the blitz trucks and go back again and repeat the whole exercise five months later and bring the cattle in. So I'm out in the bush now and I'm thinking, God, there's a lot of brumbies out here. We call them brumbies, but they weren't really brumbies. Brumbies is wild horses. They weren't really wild at all. They were abandoned stock horses. They all had white marks on their backs from where saddles, ill-fitting saddles had taken their hide off during these long droving trips that went for three months, four months, five months. And um, so I thought, what's I'm going to do? I'm going to round up these, round up some of these brumbies and see if I can sell them. So I went out to a tobacco farm, uh, a newly settled tobacco farm on the rim of the outback there, and uh, it wasn't too far a ride from Paddy's Green. And um, made myself known to the Italian guy who owned it. He didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Italian, but I made it clear that I wanted to work for him, and he said, yeah, fine. So I'm hauling tobacco out of the field, and tobacco is really sticky, horrible, nasty stuff. Put it under your arm, carry it out, and uh, take it to the shed where people strung it to long poles and put it in a, in a, barn, in a tin barn under which their fire burned so they'd dry out the tobacco. And uh, they're paying me by what I could carry out of the field. So I got this great idea. So I thought, well, I'll make two shafts, uh, nail some planks across it, uh, put a tie around Queenie's neck, put a rope around it, around the belly, and I'll be able to haul this tobacco out of the field. And I'll be able to have a lot of tobacco because I won't have to carry it out of the field. So the Italian guy saw this and he thought this was the greatest thing he'd ever seen. He wants to buy my horse. I said, nah, I'll bring you a horse. Bring you, bring your horse. And he says, yeah. So I go back to the Paddy's Green where all these brumbies are running around. And uh, I followed the railway line to the first, there was an old little railway line nearby where it had a rail motor that went out a little bit in the bush. But at the end of this, where the motor turned around, there was an outhouse there. So I checked the outhouse and it's got big rolls of toilet paper, government rolls, big things, about two feet across. You know, you could do what you do with toilet paper or you could, you know, use it for sand wood. It'd be, do the same job. So I thought, this is great. So I grabbed, steal two of those big rolls, take them back to Paddy's Green and tied them to trees and made a big V like that. And there was an old cattle yard there left, a big old log yard. It was rotten, but there was enough, enough timber still on it to make it um, blockable. And then with Queenie, I 
got on the downside of this and I got a stock whip. I'm good with whips. So chase the mob here, chase the mob there and funnel them towards this big funnel of paper up this yard. Boom, there it is. Oh, wow. There's 35, 30 head of horses there. So that's really wonderful. So lock, lock them up there, bring the logs in, they can't get out. And I thought, this is, this is really wonderful. Uh, so I thought, well, this is going to be good. I'll, uh, I'll wait till they weaken up a bit. So I left them there for three days with no water, no food, nothing. As soon as when the head started to drop, I thought, that's it. Put a rope around six of them, took them out to the tobacco farm, and uh, said to the tobacco, said to the guy, I says, here, one horse. You can buy this horse. And so he was very thrilled about buying this horse, and he paid me. Uh, we negotiated a fee, and it turned out to be like five pounds, five sterling pounds per horse. And um, and these horses were half dead from having no food and no water. So I said, look, they're, they're very, very calm. Look, there's no problem. Look here. Horses are half dead. And um, he said, yeah, okay. So he gives me the money. And I got the hell out of that farm because <laughs> as soon as you got all of those horses, they'd be, they'd be torn, all the, they'd be just going berserk because you'd have to train them to pull the logs and things and pull the drays. So. Then I'd, uh, I had all this money then. I said, well, wow. So I hang, hung around. I went back to the bush and, and it was good. Then I had I thought, well, I'm going to go down and see my Aunt Mary because she had sent messages back to me and said she had been reading my stories in Man Magazine. And Aunt Mary was my dad's sister. And... Uh, she was very encouraging when I went down to Cairns and saw her and she said, you know, she said, you write like Hemingway. And I said, really, I'm glad you think so. She said, yeah, but you should do something with your talent. You're just writing for man magazines. She said, uh, if you want to really write for and get a lot of money, you've got to write for the women's magazines. You've got to write romance. And I thought, oh, wow, romance, yeah, okay. So I go back to the bush thinking, oh, how am I going to write romance? Well, it didn't seem to be too difficult because uh, I was certainly a horn dog out there for sure. I had nothing to jump on. So, you know, I, it was easy to imagine romance. Romance to me was cuddling a woman and having a good time. That was good. So I went with that for a while and uh, wrote a couple of romance stories and they got published too. And um, then I went back to see Aunt Mary again and she says, you know, she says, you've got to do something with your talent. She says, you're wasting your time. And now, now I'm about 16 years old. And, uh, and she says, Reg Sutton is the editor of the Cairns Post, and he lives just across the street from me. I've arranged an interview. You go and see Reg Sutton and apply for a job as a cadet reporter. And I said, yeah, OK, good idea. And I'm hobbling around. I've got shoes on because out in the bush I didn't wear shoes. And my feet had splayed out, and I had to peel, had to trim the back of my feet with a pocket knife that I got hold of, and um, otherwise they'd splay out and split to the, split to your flesh and cause you all kind of problems. So I'm hobbling around. I go and see Red Sutton, and he says to me, he says, "Well, he says, uh, yeah, he said I've read some stuff on your Aunt Mary that now Aunt Mary gave me, and she says, he says you write very well. He says mm, you got a job." He says, give me your high school certificate and you're hired. So I looked him, high school certificate? He says, yes. I go, oh, okay, high school certificate, okay. He says, you don't have any problem with that, do you? He says, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 18. I wasn't, I was 16. He says, well. I said, well, we had a big fire at the cattle property and lost all the papers. He says, yeah, well, the education department will give you a copy of your high school certificate because without it, you can't get hired. I can't hire you. It's illegal. I said, okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll solve that problem. So I waited till he left that night. And when he left, I, <clears throat> I went to the sub-editor, the night guy, and I said, uh, I said, good day, my name's Colin Dangard. I'm the new night reporter. He said, you been hired? I said, yeah, Mr. Sutton hired me this afternoon. He didn't tell me that. I said, well, he's probably in a hurry. What do you want me to do? 
So he said, he says, well, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know you got I, I said, well, I don't know, just anything. What, what do you got in mind? And he said, oh, he says, this, some crazy guy out of Redfern attacked his neighbour with an axe. He said, uh, the cops are investigating it. Nobody got killed, but it's one of those axe assault stories, you know. I said, oh, yeah, OK. So I go, I go to the cop shop and uh, talk to ro and talk at length with the police and they're telling me everything I need to know and there's rattle, rattling off everything, so I thought, that's good. So I go out to the newsroom, there's nobody there except me, so I type this story out until about six or seven in the morning. I stay there. And I wrote this like I was writing for a man magazine. I wrote, but it was a quote from the cop, quote from the neighbour, quote from this, quote from that, you know, quote, 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 a little bit of description. I thought, this is, this is easy. So I slipped it under Reg Sutton's door and waited for him to come to work. And he charged down the hallway with his briefcase and slammed his office door. Three minutes later, and I'd slipped my, my story under the door, under his, under his door of his office. Three minutes later, his secretary comes in and says, Colin, Mr. Sutton wants to see you and he is not happy. I'll warn you. I said, okay. So I go and see Reg Sutton. And he says, don't sit down because this is not going to take long. He said, right now I have a dilemma. I have to figure out how to fire you. But I don't know how to legally do that because I haven't even hired you. He says, you've masqueraded yourself as a reporter for the Cairns Post. And you've downgraded our standing enormously by pretending to be somebody you are not. So, oh, I don't know. I said, I just wrote the story as I saw it. And he says, well, get out of here and I'll decide what I'm going to do. So I left and stayed there most of the day and didn't see him again. But the edition came out next morning, late that night for the morning edition. And uh, there it was, my story, big blow-up story. Everything, every golden word, as they said, it was all there. And I go, oh, I've done it, I've done it. So the, um, the secretary, his secretary comes out and says, your paycheck will be ready Friday morning, 10 o'clock. So I leave. The, then I was hired, and it was the start of an incredible journalistic career that I had. I stayed there for a couple of years, and then I went to looked on a map of Australia and I saw the nearest country was New Zealand. I thought, well, I'm going to New Zealand because it's not too far away. Start with there. So I go to New Zealand and I get hired by the uh, Rotorua Post. They hired me as their Lake Taupo correspondent. Lake Taupo is a little trout fishing lake in the middle of the North Island. And um, it was great. I thought, this is, this is really good. I stayed at... Um, uh, the Spa Hotel in Taubo. I had a 650 BSA bike that I'd bought from Australia, brought with me from Australia, brought over on a ship from Australia. And uh, at the Spa Hotel, I became good friends with uh, the proprietor, whose, whose name was Jim Burney. And he was very good friends with uh, Keith Holyoke, who would become New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. So I became very friendly with Sir Keith. And uh, we got chatting every every morning at breakfast and, and whenever he was there. And Jim Burney was singing my praise about what I was writing. And I'm a now very well established feature writer for the Rotary Post. And, and um, um, Holly Oak says to me one day, he says, what are you going to do now? And he says, you're pretty well established here. He says, uh, you're going to move on? I says, yeah. I said, uh, I want to go up the Pacific someplace. And uh, he says, oh, yeah? He so he says, here. So he wrote me a personal letter of reference signed by the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I thought, wow, this is something. So I go up to New Zealand and uh, I go up to uh, Fiji and uh, walk into the 
and the Fiji Times and uh, took myself into a, a job there as usual. Didn't seem to be difficult to do. My reputation had preceded me somewhat. And uh, so I started a great time in Fiji once again as a feature writer. So I'm writing great stuff for the Fiji Times and I'm sending off dispatches to London and Australia and I the, became uh, the News of the World correspondent in Fiji and uh, same in Sydney and this is going really good. I'm thinking, this is, this is great. I says, you can, this is just like printing your own money. And I'd become friends with uh, these New Zealand airmen who flew Sunderlands out of, uh, out of Fiji. And uh, one of the things we, we'd like to do was I had a nice apartment overlooking the big bay there. So every Friday we'd all get together and up at my place, all us guys, and we endless drinking and a couple of kegs of beer and our, our motor operandos, we'd hop in a bunch of cars and go down and, and go trolling for uh, nubile nymphettes under palm trees and things. Any any girls that were young and available, we'd just grab them, grab them, throw them in the car, take them up to our apartment uh, and be an orgy going like crazy within about, within no time at all. And we're having such a good time with this. It was just so much fun. The girls were having a good time. They're giggling and cackling and carrying on. And then um, I, uh, one day I got... Uh, Part of my job in Fiji was to go and see the police chief every morning. And he was a British guy in British outfits on, a police outfit, a great air of self-importance about him. And uh, he would tell me what I should write and shouldn't write. And he said, uh, we'd be having tea and scones at 10.30 in the morning and his, it was only me and him. And he says, yeah, he says, he, he became, we've become quite funny. He says, yeah, Colin, he says, I've got to tell you a story. He says, of course, you can't print this. But he says, uh, it's just a funny story. He says, out at, uh, out at Vanilleva, out in the island of Vanilleva, he said, on a beach out there, we had to go out and uh, quell a disturbance. All the bucks had gone crazy because there was some some girl from Australia was running naked up and down on the beach wearing nothing but a bowie and a, and a, and a uh, uh, bowie, and that's all she was wearing, a bowie knife, nothing else. She's running up and down the beach, and, of course, all the bucks, all the young Fijian guys were mesmerised with her, and they started carrying her around on a sedan chair. She became a sex goddess. Can you believe that? He's telling me. He says, of course, you can't print any of this. He says, it's just, I think it's very funny. I said, yeah. You know, that's a power of women. And they take off their clothes and guys fall over everywhere. He says, these are warriors and they fall over. That's ridiculous. And I go back to the Fiji Times. I'm sitting there and I said, well, yeah, that's a hell of a story. News of the world would love this story. Let me see, how would it go? Shapely, beautiful, naked Australian, blonde, running on the beach mesmerizing, powerful Fiji bucks, much to the anger of their wives. Hmm. No, couldn't write that here. <laughs> I could, better write, could, could write it in London. <laughs> yes, so bang it out, bang it out. Send it to News of the World like it's going on another planet. I didn't even think far enough. Well, News of the World is just over there. London is not too far away. Fiji, after all, is a British crown colony, of course. Well, I didn't think that far. I just thought of making a big splash in London with this hot, hot story. And um, so uh, I thought, well, yeah, the police chief did tell me it was in secret that he was telling me this, but uh, uh, I'm a reporter. I'm supposed to, supposed to say things that other people don't want me to write, especially if they're people in positions of power. I should be standing with the side of the people. I'm telling myself all this. It sounded all very good. So anyhow, the story comes out and uh, comes out in News of the World in London and it's a big splash. Oh my God, they went crazy for this story. And that was uh, that weekend we're having a, one of our usual soiree with all, of, all these British, these New Zealand airmen from Othala Bay 
And we've got all the babes there and there's, uh, there's, there's uh, um, half clad and no clad uh, young girls running around the apartment and they're all drunk and springing out and we're dancing and carrying on and there's lots of action on couches and every other place. And I look out the window and to my horror, there's a line of police vehicles out there. I thought, what are they doing? I wonder what they're doing here. And they're running up the steps towards my place. I'm thinking, oh my God, they're coming here. They're coming here. I'm look out, I look across the room, and here are, uh, you know, people bent over couches and rumbling and rumbling here and rumbling there. And I thought, wow, this doesn't look good. And so I try to get these these women out of the back door. The apartment was built into a bank, so the back door was another flat area. So I get them all, get as many of them I could out of there as I hear the door, the police breaking down the front door. And uh, then I, there's some there's some cage wire there, so I pull it up, pull it up, and get all these chicks in there. There's, and to my horror, I'm in the middle of a chicken coop. And chickens go berserk. I mean, there's flying chickens everywhere. And the women are screaming and carrying on. I haven't got no clothes on. There's about 15 young girls there. And, uh, and I look up and there's a flashlight coming down and at the end of the flashlight I see a double barrel shotgun. And I said, uh, excuse me, uh, don't worry, I can explain everything. And in a very British accent he says, uh, oh my dear, I don't think you can explain anything here to me. But he said, uh, you'll be explaining it to the police chief, okay? Don't move. So, anyhow, I end up in jail. And... Uh, Next morning, uh, I'm in the dock. Strange to be in the dock where I'd reported on, reported on many other misgivings of other people who had transgressed the law from the court where, as a reporter. And the, the magistrate looks at me and he's shocked to see me there. And the prosecutor said, uh, he wants to talk to you. So I go up and talk to the magistrate. And he says, Colin, he says, you are in a lot of trouble. Off the record, I have to tell you. He says, these are underage girls. He says, you can go away for a very long time with this. They're all drunk. You, he, said, um, it's, he said, I suggest you plead guilty. And the charge is supplying liquor to natives. I said, okay. So... I get go back to the dock and I read the charge out and how do I plead? I plead guilty for supplying liquor to natives. So I get deported within 24 hours from Fiji. <laughs> so I arrive, I, I, then I fly to Sydney and then I get hired because uh, uh, well, I didn't get hired right away but I went to the pub uh, where all of the journalists hang out, the bar, and I thought, well, I'll apply for a job here on the Sydney Sun or the Mirror or one of those papers. And uh, it was it was great. So that's, I did, and I, so they had run my big story from Fiji. They had picked it up from News of the World in London, re reprinted it. And, um, but uh, the, the editor wasn't too sure about me because uh, he said, I don't know, he says, you, you seem a bit controversial. He said, I don't know if we need some controversial guy is you've been deported that doesn't sound good I said yeah but it was just a stupid thing drunken party you know what I mean yeah well he says I don't know about that so um, so uh, I heard that they were going to have a beer drinking competition the day the day after that it was a Thursday I thought there's a big beer drinking competition on Friday at the, at the hotel where all the journalists hung out. I said, hmm. I told myself, that's it. I can I can drink all these people under the table, no trouble at all. So I went into training. I got 48 hours to train up for the beer drinking competition. So I denied myself, uh, just took a little bit of sip of water, a sip of this, sip of that. You know, made myself, uh, took a lot of vitamins I could find and did push-ups and do all those things that you got to do when you're going into a beer drinking competition, right? So I were at the, at, we're all 
I, I, came, I represented not a newspaper, but an independent, an associate of the Sun, I call myself, an independent associate of the Sun. And the editor of the Sun was there. And he says, uh, he says, you're not really on staff at the Sun. He says, how can you say that? I said, well, I said associate, okay. Okay, well, I said, I'm in the competition anyhow. And I said, and everybody else is going to lose. Oh, yeah? It's Jimmy Madden's over there. Jimmy Madden has never lost this, ever. He works for the Mirror. Ten years, you can't drink him under the table. I says, ah, no problem at all. I said, I'm probably the best beer drinker in the world. He says, really? That's ridiculous. That's totally ridiculous. Anyhow, the beer drinking competition starts and it was boat racing rules. Boat racing rules was schooner. You drank on schooners and schooner is a 16-ounce glass. And boat racing rules means your, the contestants stand in a circle and you drain, you drain your glass. And if you drain your glass, everybody's got to drain their glass so you can, you can, have, you can speed it up and knock out the knock out the competition very quickly. So I'm dehydrated by the time I get there. I'm highly trained up for this beer drinking competition. So I, I knock over five schooners in a row without, without even sweating an eyelid. Well, that cut the field down by two thirds. And I look over and there's the legendary Jimmy Madden and he's looking at me. He knows I'm the competition. And then these rules, you know, you. Uh, if you throw if you throw up, you got t- tossed out. You lost. You had to walk a straight line. You had to be able to read the newspaper. You were accompanied. If you wanted to take a pee, you had to be accompanied by a second to make sure that you didn't just throw up and come back. You had to you had to hold your liquor, as I said. Well, so it went on and on, and we got up to sixteen schooners, Jimmy Madden and I. Schooner seventeen. There's only Madden and I left. And I, and I, and I'm I'm feeling it, and I know Jimmy Madden's feeling it too, because he's feeling a bit wobbly. And I said, seconds, Jimmy Madden needs to take a, t- a walking test. Oh, okay. I said so. He walked Jimmy Madden, and he, they have a vote on it. There's the the, the pub is crowded with people. There's probably two hundred spectators, easily. Cars are honking outside and parking, triple parked on the street. And this is the biggest, this is the biggest thing that's happened in a long, long time at this hotel. And uh, so, anyhow, we got down a glass each, Jimmy Madden and I. Schooner 17. I said, Jimmy, you're quite a drinker, but you're not good enough. Put it down. And he says, I can't do that. Put his hands up. So I won the beer drinking competition. Three days later, I got on the wrong train, went out, I woke up, there's trees going past. I thought, God, where the hell am I? I'm supposed to be at Glebe, across the harbour. I have an apartment there. I'm looking out the windows, trains, trees going by. Oh, oh I pull the cord, train comes to a stop. Conductor comes up and he says, did you pull that cord? I said, yeah. I said, why'd you do that? I said, I'm dying. I think I'm going to die. He says, well, you're not dying on my train. Get off it. <laughs> so he kicks me off the goddamn train. Just kicks me off. And I'm like dehydrated and I feel shocking. I feel terrible. And the uh, train goes by and then there's nothing. Just trees, wilderness, a train track. And I'm sitting there thinking, God, I so, feel so bad. And then I look up and there's one of those pup trolleys coming along. I thought, that's it. I get out in the track and stop the guys. So they're really, what are you doing here? Uh, my whole life has been people asking me, what am I doing here? So I said, well, it's a long story, but I said, I've got to get back to Sydney. Sydney? That's 150 miles from here. I said, yeah, well, I don't know how I got here, but I'm in the wrong place and I'm dying. Do you have any water? Uh, you look drunk to me, says one of them. So they says, yeah, jump on here. 
So they they um, pump trolled me out of there for about two hours and I got off that. Finally got back to my place three days later and I'm dying. So I go back to the newspaper and I'm thinking, this is it, you know. And Len Cosy was the editor. Cosy calls me and he says, hey, you, come here. And Cosy was as rough as guts. Uh, he used to, he used to just, uh, we had some girl reporters and they'd burst into tears every time they saw him because he says, if you don't show me your tits, you don't do anything here. You don't get any pay unless you show me your tits, okay? Anything wrong with that? What, you look at your tits every day, I can look at them too. And she's going on like this. This is, what, this, is what, this is what it was. And I thought, well, he's going he's gonna to kick me out of here and that'll be in the end of that. He says, he's eating a meat pie and he's stuffing it in his mouth. God, he was rough, that guy. And he's scratching his balls and looking at me and he says, you know, he says, I was going to fire your ass. He says, you're a bit of a wreck, if you ask me. He says, but you won the beer drinking competition. We've never won it. You drank Madden under the table. I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm just dying. I'm halfway dying. And he says, see that window over there? He says, that desk over there? He says, that's where you are. And he says, your job is going to be police rounds. A car will pick you up at 4.30 in the morning from wherever you live, and uh, you'll go to the police club. And you're going to buy every all the cops in their drinks. You're going to have an unlimited expense account. Because he says, nothing talks better than a drunk cop, okay? But you're a beer drinking champion, so you won't get drunk. They're all amateurs. You got it? You got, you got my drift here? I said, yeah, okay. So that was my job. So I'm, the police, I'm now the police roundsman. Okay, I'm, I'm um, next after Sydney. I went to, uh, went up, got on a boat called the Chusan. I was supposed to go to Vancouver, uh, where I got a job in the Vancouver Sun uh, by mail. I got off on a boat in Hong Kong, met an old friend of mine, Alfred Lee and Steve Dunleavy, a couple of friends from Sydney. Got roaring drunk. Uh, Monday, realised the boat had sailed off without me and with all my luggage. So I ended up getting a job in Hong Kong and became editor of the Hong Kong Star. After, and this is when the Vietnam War was on, so Hong Kong was wide open. It was Sin City multiplied by 10,000. It was unbelievable. It was just had the best time. I got to speak, I got to uh, speak Cantonese somewhat, pillow talk mostly, but that's all you needed. And um, then uh, round went to Europe and all through Europe and became, uh, started collecting newspapers to, that I could correspond with. Then I went to, uh, then I went to South Africa and got to talk my way in a job at the uh, Johannesburg Sunday Times, again to be a feature writer. And that was fantastic, had a very good time there. And um, uh, went up to, and covered some stuff in Zambia where they started shooting white people. So I thought, ah, this is not good here. South Africa's going, going to hell in a handbasket. So I decided I want to get out of South Africa because uh, I'd been in communist China and uh, the, the, uh, the secret police in South Africa was in apartheid at the time. They didn't like the idea that, that, I'd, that I'd been in China. They thought I was a communist spy. I said, me, a communist spy? I'm just a stupid working stiff journalist, you know. So anyhow, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can get out of Joburg, where am I going to go next? And then I get a call from my friend Dennis Budge. Uh, we had uh, been deported from Tahiti together. After Fiji, I did a quick stint in Tahiti and got deported from there again. And um, so uh, Dennis calls me up and he says, Colin, he says, uh, where are you? I said, I'm in Joburg. I says, where are you? He says, I'm in Cape Town. He says, I've, I said, what are you doing there? He said, I've just sailed a little boat, 34-foot catch across the, across the Indian. And he says, I'm going to go to America. I said, that's funny. That's exactly where I want to go. I said, I'm 27 years old. The Viet they can't draft me for Vietnam, so I'm out of here. So I go down and join uh, Dennis. And, and uh, as we're walking down the dock in Cape Town, uh, I'm with my first wife, Kay, who was a real prissy sort of thing. And I was never 
uh, never up to her standard of what she thought a husband should be. Well, I can't blame her for that either. I, you know, I did tell her I'd screw everything that moved, so I wasn't lying about that. Uh, so we're walking down and she says, and at the end of the pier, uh, there was a magnificent yacht there owned by a guy called Franson who was a multi-zillionaire from, from Canada. And she says, oh, look at that. She says, I can see myself on the poop deck there having my tea and scones. Wouldn't that be nice? A gin and tonic maybe. Ooh. And uh, you've finally done something. I says, I'm sorry, that's not the boat. That's not, that's not the yacht. So we walk, it takes us about five minutes to walk the full length of the of Franson's yacht. And down there, look down there, there's Dennis's boat, 34 foot catch. It looked like a whole uh, heap of garbage with a sail on it. Dennis looks up and he says, hey, Cole, how you doing, mate? He says, come on down. He says, tell, tell your lady there to get those high heels off because you can't walk in high heels in this boat and you'll trip yourself in that, that uh, rope ladder. So oh yeah, she takes it. So we get down the boat and Kay looks at me and says, we are not sailing this anywhere. She says, I'm out here. I said, I don't think so. So anyhow, we, we talk her into saying and Dennis says, well, one thing he says, I've got to, he says, I'm glad you've come. He says, I know you're handy with your hands. He says, we have to, this boat keeps trying to sink. He says, it takes in water. I says, well, that's a bad thing, isn't it? I said, we're going to go to America, right? And he says, yeah. And I says, but, you slipped the boat, he says, now he says, I have to learn how to navigate. He said, I missed Africa by a thousand miles, so I can't do that again because we're going that way. It's 6,800 miles to reach Barbados. So I've got to get that under control. He says, yeah, fine. Okay, we slip the boat. I'll, I'll do the corking. I'll cork the boat. I'll learn how to do it. You learn how to navigate. So he took off his sextant and his navigation book and managed to find figure out how to use his sextant. And uh, I'm trying to plug up this boat and this old guy's hanging around the docks. His docks are always full of old guys. This old guy comes up to me and says, what are you doing with this boat? I says, well, we're going to sail it to America. He says, yeah, I'm not going to get out of the harbour in this thing. He says, it's, it's waterlogged. I says, what does that mean? He looks at me like I'm stupid. He says, you've never sailed anything at all, have you? I says, no, but I'll learn. So he pulled out a pliers from his uh, toolbox and he, and his tool pouch and he poked the side of it and water spurted out. He says, see that? It's waterlogged. So you're going to sink. I says, well, we'll plug up all the holes and, and, uh, and dry it out and we'll be fine. And he says, even if you manage to seal this boat, he said, you're going you're gonna to die at the doldrums. I says, what's that? The doldrums? You don't know what the doldrums are? Where the South Atlantic meets the North Atlantic, there's nothing for one mile or 15 miles. No wind, no nothing. Underneath the doldrums, there's 10,000 sailing ships. You don't have a motor on this piece of garbage. How are you going to get across the doldrums? You're going to die. Well, he was almost right about that one for sure. But anyhow, we sailed out and it was a long, arduous journey. The women hated each other. There's, there's, a, there's a, a saying that you should never put, a, never put women on a, on a sailing boat. It's quite true. Women on sailing boats try to kill each other. So these women were fighting all the time. And, but we did manage to sail 6,800 miles with no motor, radar, no radar, nothing. If you fell off that boat, you were dead couldn't turn the boat around uh, so you just die sharks everywhere and Dennis wonderful Dennis he didn't believe in God so he'd take off all his clothes and beat his chest and stand up on the halyard and say come on God if you're there sink me you son of a bitch you're not there that's why you can't sink me <laughs> it's gone in the middle of the night you know so anyhow got to America and um Got to, when, got, to, got to Miami and uh, walked in the Miami Herald when the, when the editor's secretary was got, took a break or something like dashed in and Larry Jinks was the editor and I shook hands with Larry, leaned over his desk and said, I'm Colin Dangard, I'm from Australia. He says, well, if you're looking for a job, there's no jobs here. 
I said, well, that's okay. I said, I, I got a rest. I've just sailed a 34-foot catch from, from, uh, from South Africa. He said, you did? Turned out he was a Biscayne Bay yachty, so he was absolutely thrilled with my stories. So no, I, uh, I got hired and became a feature writer again and had a wonderful time there. Won lots of awards with the Miami Herald, writing feature stories for them. Then I get a call from Rupert Murdoch. I'm now separated myself from the Miami Herald. I kept them as a client, but I had, was now syndicating to 130 publications each month in 30 different countries. Then Rupert Murdoch calls me and he says, Colin, he says, we're coming to America. We're going to start the National Star. We'd want you to be the Hollywood editor for us. And I said, oh, Rupert, I'm sorry, I'm very well ensconced right now. I've got my old deal going. Everything's going fine. He says, you're going to get a call from Sir Larry Lamb. I said, OK. So Larry Lamb calls me up. And he says, so, he says, you're going to Hollywood. You're going to be the Hollywood reporter for the National Star. The National, you're going to be the Hollywood editor for the National Star. I says, I don't think so. I said, I just bought a house in Boca Raton. I got horses at the polo club. I'm making so much money, I don't know what to do with it. I'm syndicating in uh, 30 countries. And he says, well, how much money do you make? And I, I thought of what I made and I doubled it. And he says, oh, we can match that easy. What else you got? I says, well, I'm syndicating to 30 countries. And he says, well, he says, I don't see a problem with that as long as we have the stories first and the national star, I don't give a damn. And I said, oh, okay. And I, I said, well, I got these horses at the Palm Beach Polo Club. Oh, they got those trucks with little horse carriages and they take them to America, take them to Los Angeles for you, no problem at all. What else you got? And I said, well, I just bought a new house in Boca Raton. He says, no problem, they got lots of houses in, in LA, we'll buy your house there. Wherever you want to buy it, we'll just put you out. So I said, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So uh, I could keep my syndication. I, they were paying me a lot of money. So it was the beginning of a huge, huge, wonderful time as a, as a very highly paid syndicated, self-syndicated columnist. So I was the only self-syndicated person in America, which I could never figure out why other individuals didn't start their own syndicates. Why not? So, but I could never figure that out. Anyhow, so I'm in, I'm in Hollywood having a great time and Rupert's paying me a lot of money and my syndicate's making me a lot of money and I get a television show and I'm working on, I'm, I'm on that show. It's called uh, uh, Colin Dangard, uh, just a Colin Dangard show. And uh, On View with Colin Dangard, it's called. So I get a house on the beach in Malibu and I get divorced, which is a smart thing to do. And and I filled my house with beautiful women and have a secretary who did nothing else to keep track of my women. I had 15, 14 girlfriends at once. And I ran on the beach and kept my stamina up so I could satisfy all these girls. And I'm making so much money, I just didn't know what to do with it. I'm having such a good time. And uh, so uh, I'm on a plane going from Zurich to London one day. I'm bird dog and Elizabeth Taylor, as I always did. And she hated, hated my guts. And she looks across in the first class and I'm sitting there. Oh, she just about had a fit. So she tore a strip off me. And she says, you know, she says, all you do in your life is write nasty stuff about people. Half it's not even true. I don't know if it's, I said, well, it is. I got a tape recorder, of course it is. She says, well, get rid of that tape recorder right now. So I okay, put, I said, there we are. So she says, I want to tell you a couple of things. She says, you're quite a nice guy, really. He says, she said, but you spend your life writing nasty stuff about people and making money out of, out of turning people's lives into horror stories. And what have you done with your life? And I had to think for a while. I'm, I, I must say, I came up short. I said, well, I write stories. She says, you write stories about people who've done something. But what have you done? I thought, well, well I'm one of the most syndicated people in the world. Rex Reed may have bigger readers than me, but I don't think so. Oh, geez. She says, you're wasting your life. So I go back to Malibu, go back to my house on the beach. Um, yeah, I'm making all this money. I'm thinking, you know, she's right. Elizabeth Taylor's right. What have I done with my life? I haven't done anything. Sure, I report on people. Yeah, well, anybody could do that. I get a tape recorder that does that. I just put it together. Oh. So 
I said, that's it, I'm going to quit the whole thing. Call up Rupert, quit the star, he didn't care. He, he was on his way, everything was fine. Call up my editors, no, I'm not doing this and not doing that anymore. So I feel greatly relieved now. And uh, I got 13 girlfriends and, uh, you know, I had a, a secretary did nothing else to keep track of my girlfriends and, and uh, you know, it was, it was a big challenge. Uh, but anyhow, so... Uh, I, and Renee, who was in charge of organising my girlfriend, she said, you know, you're going to lose all this. You're just walking away from it. I said, yeah, isn't that great? And I said, yeah, I don't need it. I'm going to go out and do something different. She said, what is it? I said, I have no idea. Now, isn't that exciting? I have no idea. And she calls my accountant. My accountant calls me and says, Colin, this is a very stupid idea, whatever it is you got. He says, you've been drinking? I said, no, I haven't had a drink for a while. I said, no. I said, I'm out of here. And he says, well, you're going to go broke. And sure enough, I said, well, if I do, I do. But I'm going to find out if I can do something else besides this. I said, an orangutan could do this. I said, I want to do something exciting. Was it Elizabeth Taylor that got you to quit? Yeah. Elizabeth Taylor, so I'm thinking of what she's saying. And so, <clears throat> so, I was, so okay, that's it. Then I get a call from the studio and they said, we're making a movie in Australia, would you like to go? And I says, yeah, if it's Australia, I'll go. And for me, to, a movie company to get me on a set was a big coup because they Hollywood hadn't yet got the idea I, I was abandoning it, and uh, but I was. And uh, I, just, I said, what's the movie about? Well, it's about, it's an adaptation from a poem. I said, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> I didn't care about it because I'm going to go to Australia and see my family and see my brothers and sisters. This s stupid studio is going to pay, pay for the money and I'll just make an appearance on the set and write a story and I'll be okay. Just make it whole for them. And I go on the set, the movie is The Man from Snowy River. And I'm looking at it, I thought this is the dumbest movie I ever saw. It's adapt, uh, an adaptation from a, a poem by Banjo Patterson. I was very familiar with the poem, The Man from Snowy River. I said, how can you make a movie about that? But anyhow, then I saw the director comes and says, Colin, he says, I want you to look at our dailies, look at this. And I see a close-up of an Australian stock sale. I said, why did you shoot that? He says, we're going to show how Australians really ride. He says, you know, they ride horses like the Cossacks used to. Hell bent. I said, tell me about it. I'm from there. That's what I did. Ride hell bent. You know, that's what we did. Rode horses into the ground. Got off them. If they didn't get up, slit their throats and got another one. There's plenty out there. It was very brutal. Brutal on people, brutal on horses. It was the most brutal thing I ever experienced as a, as a horseman. So, it's, it's, uh, uh, so um, I thought to myself, wait a minute. Americans are riding this stupid Western saddle, which nobody can ride. They can ride English saddles, which are very twee and very nice and put on your nice thing and you, you look good jumping over jumps. And, but they're no good for riding out in the bush, rough country. Australians have these saddles that got knee pads on them we call polies. So that's it. I'm going to take that saddle America and sell it. And I'm going to ride the man from Snowy River. I think it's going to be a hit movie. And I did. Got all my money together. Got a shipment of saddles from Australia from Sid Hill and Sons. And uh, did a big ad campaign on borrowed money from my girlfriends. And uh, said, ride like the man from Snowy River. And I went from being dead broke to almost losing the house to selling $100,000 worth of saddles a month. Half it was mine. And we are talking 35 years ago. That was a huge sum of money. So I'm wealthy again. I thought, well, what a great country America is. I just can't get over this country. You can fall on your ass and you can get up and do it again. Wow. Huh, it's a really good thing. <laughs> so, anyhow, I rode that for a long time. And I thank Elizabeth Taylor for that. 
if it wasn't her pushing, telling me to get get my head screwed on and go and do something original. And I was the first guy to bring a new saddle to America in almost 300 years. Nobody did that. And it was a simple old Australian stock saddle that I had rode, ridden as a boy. Come full circle. Made a fortune with it. And uh, started whole companies in India producing them because Australia couldn't produce the numbers I needed. I was getting shipments of saddles to my, I moved out of my house down the beach in Malibu, got a, a much bigger property up on Canaan Doom Road where I now am. And there's a parking lot there that's almost, uh, that was almost an acre parking lot. I had a shipment come in that was so heavy that when we stacked the saddles nose to nose in this parking lot and filled the entire parking lot. So, you know, it was, it was a great ride and fantastic. And, and that's what you're still doing today. That's what I'm still doing. That's my main business, but my main business now, I'm starting to write again. I like to write books as I, I've got a, I've got a novel out there called Talking With Horses. Um, the horse for me has always been a very special animal because without the horse, I'd be nobody. Without the horse, I wouldn't be able to speak. Without the horse, I wouldn't have a business. Without the horse, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be a writer. The horse is the key to everything in my life. Do you have any regrets in your life? No, not at all. Uh, yeah, the first wife I could have done without her. Sailing across the boat, my friend Dennis, sailing from Africa, my friend Dennis decided that these two women were a pain in the ass and he called me into his chambers, as he called them, his chambers, were four of us on this leaky wooden, wooden boat. And he says, the captain needs to speak with you. And I says, really? So we're all formal. He reaches behind himself and he pulls out a book, a maritime law. He says, punches it here, it says here, I'm the captain of the ship. I have to make a decision here to protect the life of the vessel and those aboard. So I have to make a decision here. These two women are endangering the ship with their behaviors. One of them picked up a knife the other day. We could have a death on board. He said, so, he says, I have to ask you a question. How much do you love your wife? <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's off and on, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? I said, how much do you love your wife? And he says, well, she's a sailor. Your wife's not. One of these, one of these, one of these has to go overboard. <laughs> I said, so, Dennis, I don't think so. I said, they'll lock us up. I said, we leave South Africa with four people aboard and we get to Barbados, our first landfall, and we have three people aboard. What are we going to say happened to the fourth? And he said, we could say he got swept overboard. He said, we have no radio, no way to contact anybody. And it was true, we had no radio, we had nothing. If we sunk in that boat, there'd be the end of everybody. They would never know where we were. Yet. And uh, so... I didn't want to do that, but anyhow. So, yeah, I do have some regrets. I wish I... But if you, if you had to live your life all over again, are there things you wish you had done? Uh, no. As far as the big picture, no. I always wanted to be a writer. And if I say so myself, that's what I'm good at. And you were mingling with a lot of Hollywood celebrities and stuff. Yes, so I had a... I was very, very successful at that. And I had a talk show... Robin Leach took it over. He got backed by some big money and it became Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And at, at that time, I was getting out of it. I was getting out of Hollywood. I want to do something else. What so. did you think of the Hollywood scene that you were um, in? A bunch of pretenders, a bunch of opportunities. But I always looked at um, celebrities as being stalks of corn wavering in the field to be harvested by me. That was it. I felt they had a story to tell and I was the guy to tell it on my terms. And it'd be shooting straight from the hip. And if they were smart, they would understand that any publicity is good publicity. Yes, if they were smart, but a lot of them are not too smart. But I did get sued a lot. Frank Sinatra sued me for $30 million 
back when 30 million was 100 million. Uh, Mia Farrow sued me. You know, I get sued a lot. But uh, uh, Rupert was always first on the ticket, on the docket, and I'd be the second one. But interestingly, Rupert was such an amazing person to work for. He never mentioned it to me. I'd get a, sore, a lawsuit from $20 million for Frank Sinatra. He, he, I'd just get a call from his attorney and said, Colin, we have to talk about this. Frank Sinatra says you made up that entire story. I says, well, he's full of crap. I said, I have a tape recording of the interview. There's a picture of me holding a tape recorder while I'm with Sinatra. How can he deny that? He said, really? I said, yeah. So I went to court and it got tossed out. So the only person who was successful at suing me was Mia Farrow, who uh, the story was she hated kissing Robert Redford. And uh, somebody called me from, from Rupert's office and said, uh, Rupert doesn't think this story is true. And I says, tell Rupert I have it on very reliable sources. She comes back to me and says, Rupert says there wouldn't be a woman alive who didn't want to kiss Robert Redford. And I says, well, I got on good. Well, I lost that. I lost that round. But interestingly, Rupert didn't. So Mia did not, she, she denied? Yeah, she denied it and she got paid out. It cost, uh, cost News Limited a uh, million dollars or something. But so you, you, you said that Mia Farrow, M- Mia Farrow... Hated kissing Robert Redford. Hated kissing Robert Redford. Yeah, and I believed a stringer. I believe I didn't have the information firsthand. I trusted a stringer who had been working for me for several years, or for well, two or three years anyway. So that was, wasn't right. But Rupert picked it up right away. He said, tell Colin I don't believe that. If he wants to go with it, he can go with it. And uh, so I believe the stringer. Uh, it happens, doesn't it, you know? You can't be right, you can't be right on everything. You, you have no children? What? No, ch- no children? Yeah, I have, uh, I have one son. His, uh, uh, and his mother was, uh, she, was, she became a top executive at, at Amazon and made a ton of money. I trained her up to be a public relations person because that was my business. And uh, because of that training, she got a job at Amazon when that was starting. And they didn't have much to pay her in those days, so they gave her a whole lot of stock. So guess what? She was worth many millions. Uh, and my son, she took the son, took my son basically and said, your dad's a, a, a chronic crazy person. He's out of his loop. He's just nuts. You don't want, don't want anything to do with him. So Christian, the son, he, he sort of sided with her a bit, and I don't blame him. Uh, but, you know, I did. I had to go to court several times to uh, battle claims that I was had endangered the life of a minor child uh, just because I took him scuba diving without a tank and let him buddy dive off my tank. And we get into court. And he goes home and, I said, and there's sharks everywhere out of Catalina. And uh, so he goes home and tells his mother, I said, don't tell your mother about this. So he goes home and first he tells his mother, yeah. He says, dad put some weight, put a big weight belt on me. And then we dive off together. And he went down, there's sharks everywhere. And he just gave me the breathing when I could breathe like this. And so I get the court on that one. And the judge says, well, are you a qualified scuba diver instructor? I said, no. So let me get this right. You take your son diving without the right equipment and you're not even a scuba diver instructor? Well, I got a ration for that one. Then I took him to Australia in the bush where I'm from and showed him how he used to live and he ended up in hospital for that for dehydration because he wouldn't drink anything because there was dead cattle in the water hole. I said, well, that doesn't matter. I said, look, the, the dead cattle are there. We can drink out of there, okay? <laughs> that didn't work at all. <laughs> what would you say is your greatest strength? Um, resilience. I just, I believe in go. No matter what, go. 
and you can fall on your ass, you can uh, make mistakes, but from every time you fall and from every mistake you'll learn something. And you don't fall the same way twice. You don't make the same mis mistake twice. But uh, the thing is to get up off the canvas and go. What are your thoughts? Clearly you are not risk averse. And what, what, what are your thoughts on taking risks in life? Risk is as necessary in life as the air you breathe. If you don't take a risk, then you don't excel your whole spirit and body to its, to its extent. And the more risk you take, the better off you are. Because risk pumps adrenaline, adrenaline pumps your body, that pumps your brain, it pumps your whole being. Without risk, you are nobody. Without risk, you might as well sit on a couch and get fat and die. But risk is, risk is everything. It's not something, it's everything. Yeah, I, th I think risk, I think adrenaline is the secret ingredient in doing great things in life. There's yeah. so, many, so many things that we're scared to do, and, it, and when you just sit there on your sofa and think about it, you're not going to do it. It's too, it's too daunting. But when the, moment, when the moment comes, when that woman comes in your life or that opportunity comes in your life and, and that risk needs to be taken, adrenaline will get yes, you through it. Yes, you, you've... you've Adrenaline is, is what pumps our heart, what pumps our spirit. Without that, we are nobody. And you have to take risk. I ride horses every other day, and I find the steepest, nastiest thing I can find. And I don't feel I'd have ridden unless I feel a heart thump. Oh, go, wow. Now that was, <laughs> that was good. You know what I mean? So you gotta, you got to take risk. Without risk, it's nothing. Life is nothing. Um, just meeting that girl across there, you've got to take the risk that she's going to tell you, no, you're an idiot. You've got to take, or you might go over and she would say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, but you've got to take the risk. You can't, because risk is a false narrative because what are you taking a risk for? You're risking. A result. Well, you, you're here. You're not over there where you can get the result. You don't know what the result is. So the idea of risk is totally, totally without merit, put it that way. And when you take a risk and you achieve it, and I ride horses and I find really steep, rough country that gives me a heart thump, and if I've, if I've got, oh, if I look at something, I say, can I do that? I can't do it. I want to say, yeah, I can do it. And once I've had that discussion with myself, I can't w go away. Because I'd get over there 10 feet away and say, you're a coward. You're an absolute coward. You walked away from that. What sort of person are you? I have, have this conversation with myself. You have to live with yourself the rest Boom. of the day. Well, you're going to do it. Ooh. Okay. Uh, that's what you've got to do. And if you do that, You'll, you'll, I'm 81 years old. I went to, had a medical uh, uh, three months ago. I have a heavy duty truck driver's license. I don't know why I can drive semis, but I don't drive semis, but I just like the idea of having it. Um, and the doctor looked at my chart while I'm going to his medic and he called his associate and he says, hey, look at this. And the associate looked at the figures. He looked at me and he says, uh, you know, he says, you have the blood pressure of a high school athlete. I said, what do you do? I said, everything I can, possibly. <laughs> he said, well, keep doing it. <laughs> That's great. All right. Colin, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. I wish you lots of luck.